The second major part of the creed moves on to talk about God the Son. In the first article, we've affirmed God as creator, the everlasting Father, the almighty, eternal God, who made the world and everything in it out of nothing by the power of His Word. That article of the creed separates Christianity from religions of the East, such as Buddhism and Hinduism, as well as animism and pantheism, other forms of religion. But the second article of the creed, which focuses so exclusively on Jesus Christ, separates Christianity also from other monotheistic religions, such as Judaism and Islam. They too have an understanding of Jesus as a human prophet. But the article of the creed reminds us that Jesus is more than a prophet, more than a human teacher. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Here we find the Creed trying to express in a nutshell the very complex and very rich Christian understanding of the identity and the significance of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus? Why is he so important? In Jesus' own day, this was a controversial question. Some said he was a great prophet or teacher or maybe the carpenter's son of Nazareth. Some said he was a demon-possessed man. But the Christian church answers with Simon Peter, who in response to Jesus' own question, who do people say that I am? Said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so the creed begins to explain what it is about Jesus that is so important. God has revealed himself uniquely in Jesus. The God who has spoken throughout the Old Testament now speaks not through prophets, not through visions and dreams. He comes as a human being. There was not before that time, there will not be after that revelation, another revelation of the same nature, that Jesus is the only revelation of that nature of God, God in human form, in Jesus. We hear not only words, we see a person. We see a life that is lived. We see a death that dies on Calvary. And so a comprehension of God is, is just blown out of the water. Because what seemed to be impossible in terms of the ancient philosophies, even to the human mind, becomes reality in this man, Jesus of Nazareth. His name was Jesus. Christ was not the name he was given. That is a title that, that faith attaches to Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is the Christ. Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one. Let us first look at these two words, Jesus and Christ. Jesus is the human name of the second person of the Trinity. The name that he was given at his human birth in Bethlehem, but a name with a very deep meaning by his mother Mary and by his foster father, Joseph. Jesus was uh, a, a popular 
personal name. Jesus was a name to be found elsewhere in the Old Testament and among the Jewish people. It's the same name in the uh, Old Testament as the word Joshua or Jeshua. And it means literally the salvation of the Lord or the Lord is salvation. Deliverer, rescuer, savior. So when the announcement of the birth of Jesus took place uh, in Matthew 1, Joseph was told, you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So it was appropriate that the person born in Bethlehem in the reign of Herod the Great to Joseph and Mary be called Jesus because he was going to be the ultimate divine deliverer who would save people from their ultimate problem, which was not economic oppression or military oppression, or poverty or ignorance. Those things matter in God's world. They're, they're evils to be done away with, but ultimately the problem was the broken relationship with God and he would save people from their sins. This underlines the fact that he is the Savior. Behold the Savior of mankind to bleed and die for thee. The word Christ, we often regard simply as the surname of Jesus, the, the family name, the vague title, and it's become devalued as a result of that. Christ is not a proper name. Most many people think that it is, but Christ describes the office or ministry of Jesus. In Hebrew language rather than Greek terminology, it's the Messiah, it's the anointed one. The Greek equivalent is Christos, which means the same thing, the anointed one. It takes us not only to the personal name of Jesus to be the Savior, but perhaps expands, as it were, our understanding of him. It's very interesting to see how often, for instance, Paul speaks of Christos, Jesus, Messiah, Jesus, although it's translated Christ Jesus, but Paul is emphasizing Jesus as the Messiah, as God's anointed one. When I say Jesus Christ, if I don't say it, it's a word of cursing and blasphemy. I'm affirming, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He is Jesus, the Christ. Anointed through and by the Holy Spirit to minister salvation to the human race. He was the one you know, promised in the Old Testament to the Jews, and he has come in fulfillment of that. In the Old Testament, there is the expectation of a king in the line of David and following in the great traditions of David, who will come? He will be anointed by God. And uh, the book of Isaiah talks about the Spirit of God being upon me, God's servant who will come, the anointed one, anointed by God's Spirit. So there's an Old Testament expectation of this great king figure who will deliver the nation. Where the New Testament goes beyond that, it takes that to one step higher, and it's a very big step, that this anointed one is not merely a king leader chosen by God, but God himself will be the leader for the nation, who'll bring deliverance not merely from the Romans, but from all the shackles and burdens that uh, just crush us, the burden of sin, the burden of our woe and guilt, all the mess that this world is caught up in. This is the person to whom history has been working up, that God has sent his divine agent, in fact his own self, his own son, into the world as uniquely anointed by the Holy Spirit to be the agent of transformation and salvation, not just for individuals, but actually for the whole of fallen creation. Jesus, the Christ, anointed as king, as kings were in those days, as priest, as priests were in those days, but anointed also as sacrifice, as sacrifices were anointed in those days. So this word Christ then adds to the meaning of Jesus, the divine 
dimension and the salvation dimension. This Jesus is God in plan that has come here to be the Messiah, the Anointed One, to die for the sins of the world. So that the coming of Jesus Christ means that you and I can know forgiveness of sins, can relate to God as Father again. But it also points forward to the fact that one day our fallen and broken world will be restored and recreated and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. That's the work of the Messiah, so we need to draw it on a very broad canvas. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And ransom captive I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Now, the first major point that the Creed is trying to make is that there is something significant about Jesus which goes far beyond anything that can be said about any other human being. When we speak about Jesus Christ as God's only Son, as the Apostles' Creed does, we're using it in a very unique way. As the early Christians came to terms with the shattering impact that Jesus had had on their lives and on all that they were, they went back again and again to the Old Testament to try and find clues and models and helps. And one of the passages they went to was Proverbs chapter 8, which talks about God's wisdom. And wisdom says in Proverbs 8, the Lord brought me forth as the beginning of his work. And they said, ah, now this reminds us of Jesus. And in fact, some of the New Testament writers draw on the language of wisdom to explain who Jesus is and how Jesus relates to the Father. And for Christians, we need to talk about the idea of Jesus being the Son of God or Jesus being God incarnate. Before the incarnation, Jesus was the second person of the Trinity. There's one God with three persons. And the second person of the Trinity is called the Word, with a capital W. And when the Word became incarnate on earth, it was Jesus. John 3.16 in the King James Version of the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The French translation of that, he gave son fils unique, his unique Son. What's unique about the relationship of Jesus as the Son of the Father, the eternal Son of God? Well, it's not a biological question. It's not a matter of genes and chromosomes and DNA. We're talking here about that eternal relationship, that reciprocity of love and holiness that has forever bound together in the eternal community of the Trinity, the Father and the Son with a bond of love in the Holy Spirit. There never was a time when Jesus was not the one who proceeded from the Father, not indeed as a human being, because and here it gets very complicated. Um, they think of Jesus as this divine being, God's second self, if you like, who then becomes human at a point in history. But they say 
the one who became human is the one who from all eternity was equal with God and was, as I say, God's second self. And we know that he is pre-existent before the world because he was with the Father and through him the world and all things were made. St. John tells us this in the beginning of his Gospel. Uh, Paul does the same thing in, in that Christ hymn in, in Colossians chapter 1, making the eternal unity of God and Jesus explicitly clear. So that Jesus, you know, is not, you know, sort of one step down from God. Jesus is not, you know, a created being, uh, that Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. He is the deity incarnate. This became a controversial issue also in the early church. The one who comes to us as Jesus is none other than the one that's always prophesied to fill that role. So the human Jesus is, you could say, it sounds strange to say, but pre-incarnate, he is already who he's going to become. A man named Arius arose who denied that Jesus was the eternal Son of God. He said Jesus was a great and mighty being, but he was not uncreated. There was a time when he was not. And over against the teaching of Arius, the Council of Nicaea, which met in the year 325 A.D., declared that Jesus Christ was begotten but not made, eternally begotten, eternally the Son, the only Son, not made, not a creature. Well, there's a mystery here. There's something none of us can fully fathom and completely understand with our limited human minds. God tells us, isn't it, in Deuteronomy, that, that there are some things that he has revealed to us and some things which are still his own secrets. And I think the exact nature, the defining nature, the relationship of God the Father and God the Son, we can't expect to be able fully to encapsulate in words like a legal definition that will satisfy everybody. Part of the problem, of course, here, as with much theology, is that we're straining at the borders of language. And that's not something to be ashamed about. Um, if we could simply put all this theology into a test tube and cook it up and see it, then it wouldn't be theology anymore. It would be chemistry or physics or something. Um, but we shouldn't be surprised that our language gets stretched to the limit. But that should make us humble and reverent um, because we're actually treading on very holy ground here. And if God is God, I mean, if God is just an idea in my head that I can play around with, then who cares how I'm rearranging all these ideas and images. But if God is God, then it really matters that when we're talking about him, we're talking about the one who made us, who loves us, and before whom we must one day render an account. So it's important to realize that these are only our human words uh, to describe a reality which is bound to be far greater and beyond them. Of the Father's love begotten, ere the worlds began to be, He is Alpha and Omega, He the source, the ending He. Evermore and evermore. One of the earliest affirmations, the Apostle Paul refers to it in 1 Corinthians, is what distinguishes us as Christians is the affirmation, we say Jesus is Lord. One very fine book about the early Christians says, as diverse as they may have been in the various towns where they grew up, the one thing they all agreed on is that the human Jesus is the exalted Lord. The early Christians used the word Lord for Jesus, both to address him and to talk about him. And it's a complicated word because in their world, the word they used in Greek was kyrios, and that was quite a simple word at one level. It was a polite term. If you were in school, you might refer to your school teacher as kyrios. It would be like in English we say, sir. Um, you know, excuse me, sir, can I do this or that? So it's just a polite way of talking about somebody. But then the same word goes all the way up the scale, and quickly you discover that kyrios, Lord, is a title, and it's a royal title, and it's a title 
that Caesar, the emperor in Rome at the time when Jesus was born, when early Christians were going about their business, Caesar claimed to be the world's lord. He was sovereign in the ancient world and people attributed to Caesar from time to time uh, ideas of divinity. This is a divine title, Kyrios. So to say in a Roman dominated world that Jesus is Lord is to make a counter claim. They're actually upstaging Caesar. They're saying Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. That's why Paul gets put on trial in Acts chapter 17 for saying that there is another king, namely Jesus. And it's clear that this is seen as a threat to the Roman power. And to make him Lord of Lords and Lord of all, as the New Testament does, puts him not only over against the human power of Caesar, but far over in superior terms to that position of Caesar has in the world. But it doesn't stop there, it goes on, because a lot of the passages from the Old Testament that the early Christians quote when they're talking about Jesus as Lord are passages which in the Old Testament are using this word Lord to refer to Israel's God. Now this is a complicated bit of the story, but it's very important because in the Old Testament, by the time it came into the Christian era, many people read that book in Greek rather than in Hebrew because Greek was the common language of so much of the world. And when they took the personal name of Israel's God, Yahweh, they translated that into Greek as Kyrios, Lord. So when the early Christians quote a passage from the Old Testament about Yahweh, and they quote it as referring to Jesus as Lord, they are well aware of what they're doing. I'll give you an example. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11, Paul says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. At that point he is quoting from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, where it is Yahweh who says, to me and me alone, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. And that's one example out of many in Paul, where you've got an Old Testament text about Yahweh, Kyrios in the Septuagint, coming through into the New Testament as a reference to Jesus. And then Paul goes on triumphantly, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Kyrios, to the glory of God the Father. Now. Lord there is much, much more than just sir, just a polite way of talking to somebody slightly senior to oneself. It's a way of combining these two things. Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. Jesus is the Lord, the Yahweh, who we know in the Old Testament. And that enables Paul to do something relating to what we were talking about a moment ago about the Trinity, that he can take the word God, theos in Greek, and the word Lord, Kyrios in Greek, and he can put them side by side so that though he knows that God and the Lord are in one sense the same being, equally divine, part of the same monotheistic entity, he can talk about one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 20, we have this remarkable encounter between Jesus and one of the disciples, Thomas. Thomas says that he will only truly believe in the resurrection when he sees the wounds in Jesus' side. He then sees them and he confesses, my Lord and my God. And what the creed is trying to do is to say, this is what Christians ought to believe about Jesus. That this is our response, not just Thomas's response. That in some way, in encountering the risen Christ, we are encountering someone who we have to recognize as none other than God incarnate, none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. The effort to speak of Lord is to be sure that we're not giving anybody else the loyalty we give to him. So when we say Jesus is Lord, we really do mean he, he is sovereign, he rules, he's over all. It's been said that uh, unless Jesus is Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. And for us to say it not only as a statement uh, uh, of faith about the role of Christ in the world, which is true, but we're also saying that he is our Lord personally. So the Lord means you're surrendering your life to him, but in surrendering that life, uh, you're not putting yourself under the way you would to a dictator 
a, a, an earthly king, a totalitarian ruler, a tyrant. And what's distinctive about the lordship of Jesus as he reveals his lordship is that he doesn't come at us from above to squash us. He comes from down below. He uh, washes the disciples' feet. You're giving it to somebody who serves you. If Jesus is Lord in any or all of those senses, one of the things that has to happen is you have to do what he says. There's no point calling him Lord, Lord, and then ignoring when he says, now I want you to do this. And therefore we're saying that he is the governor, the boss, the controller of our lives. And all that we do comes under his lordship and we are to live in obedience to him. Not because he's setting us random tasks just to see if we will do whatever he says, but because the things that he asks of us are the things whereby not only we become more fully and truly human beings ourselves, but whereby we can take forward his purposes for the whole world. Lord, in the strength of grace, with a glad heart and And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost. When we speak of Jesus entering the world through the womb of the Virgin and conceived by the Holy Spirit, we're dealing with the most memorable, the one that gets into the creed, of all the ways in which we talk about it. The technical term is incarnation. Carne uh, means flesh. Uh, he took on flesh. And it's developing the idea that Jesus is none other than God who has entered into our world in order to redeem us. The almighty God, the eternal transcendent God, has come among us as one of us, as a fragile baby in a manger, and then as a man on a cross. At the incarnation, he emptied himself, as St. Paul says in Philippians 2. He became incarnate, that does not mean he ceased to be God, but in his earthly life, his Godhead was hidden, hidden under the veil of the flesh. It's, it's quite a sort of shocking belief in a way. It's a belief that the little baby who was born of Mary, that that baby was actually God himself made flesh. In a sense, it's shocking enough to say that about a uh, 30-year-old man, but to say it about a newborn baby is even more shocking. And I suppose one would actually have to say that a three-week-old embryo was the word made flesh. Not that he ceased to be God, but that he also entered into a human life. But that he's not just the baby. That this baby is divine, the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. That's a pretty stunning claim that say that God, the creator of the universe, uh, well, at least the second person of the Trinity, came down, took flesh, became a human being, was born, and lived a life among us. St. John's Gospel tells us that the Word became flesh. And that means that we are dealing with a God who doesn't remain distant from us, but who chooses to enter into our history in Jesus Christ in order to redeem us. The New Testament writers go back again and again to the creation story in Genesis 1 and 2. And in Genesis chapter 1, and then differently in 2, but in parallel, we find the creation of the world with human beings given a particular task and role within God's world. 
in Genesis 1, it says that human beings are made in God's image, male and female, and that they are given a task of looking after the world that God has made. They are to be stewards of creation. They are to take care of it and enable creation to grow and flower. And the image of the garden with Adam and Eve as the gardeners is all important really there. But you know what happens if you leave a garden and don't touch it for a year, it goes wild. The world is designed to work best under the wise stewardship of human beings. Now, that's phase one. When then the world rebels and human beings rebel, what they do is instead of looking up and worshipping the God in whose image they're made and reflecting his love into the world, they start to look around at the world and take orders from the world, from the snake, from the seasons, from the sun and moon, and worship bits and pieces of the created order. And as a result, their humanness starts to deconstruct. And it's what we call death. Because if you're not worshipping the God who is the life giver, you're not drawing life from him and instead you're buying into a system which is going to decay and die. What is God going to do when the human race go that route? And the answer is the original plan still holds. He is going to have to come and take upon himself the humanness which the human race has now caused itself to be. In other words, this decaying and dying thing in order to exhaust the power of that decay and death by taking it upon himself in order to bring about new creation. This is not the way in which you would read, for instance, a Greek myth. This is not a god that came down from Mount Olympus to walk around and, and, and have you know, adventures or see what's going on or whatever. This is a God who came to identify with us and to redeem us. So that it's not a God walking around. It's not a God that came down. It's a God who joined himself to a full humanity. You have to remember that part of what the early church was wrestling, one of the earliest heresies in the church was Gnosticism, particularly in its docetic form, which did not acknowledge that Jesus came in the flesh. If you read the first two letters of John, 1 John, 2 John, the opponents there are those who deny that Jesus came in the flesh. And that may be some early form of this, you know, docetic heresy. Docetism is the belief that Christ only appeared on earth. He did not really become human. He is just God in a human appearance, but not truly man. His humanity was only a seeming humanity. This is what docetism means, that which seems or appears but is not really so. And that became a major Christian heresy in the second and into the third centuries. If he had not become truly human, truly incarnate, the scheme of salvation would break down. There's only been one person ever like Jesus who is both fully human and fully divine in one and the same person not half human and half God, but both God and man in one and the same person. There's nobody been ever like him. The divine and the human nature are in some mysterious way an integral part of who God is. One of the most amazing passages is Paul's so-called the kenosis passage. Paul says that we are to have the same orientation of being that, that Jesus had, Philippians 2.5, and then he describes what that is, who being in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be exploited or manipulated, but emptied himself. And then in the Greek it says, having taken the form of a servant. The Greek structure is very clear. The taking the form of a servant precedes the emptying. The becoming in human likeness precedes the emptying. And I think what Paul is wrestling there with this question of how how do you separate out the divine and the human nature of Jesus? And I think Paul's answer is you don't. You can't. The divine and the human nature are, are thoroughly intertwined, inseparably intertwined. So that you have the Messiah on earth in historical time as a fully human being who eats and drinks and sleeps and agonizes on the cross but that human being is also fully divine. 
and that's why Jesus is the Messiah. Unless he was fully divine and fully human, he could not save. Unless he was fully human, he cannot save humanity. Unless he's fully divine, he's not powerful enough to save humanity. So that in this person who, who became incarnate and walked the earth and became one of us, you have God with us. You have God with humanity, fully human, but divine and therefore powerful enough to rescue us from the powers of evil and death and sin. So the great themes of scripture, the great themes of all true Christian theology are creation and new creation. And at the heart of that, the problems within the old creation solved by the death and resurrection of the Son. So that's why incarnation matters. It's not a kind of an odd thing as though God were to turn into a sort of a spaceman and come from another planet um, or like a Superman figure to come and just save the world in that cheap way. In fact, often today in movies and so on, the Superman myth is really a parody of the Christian story, rather a, a cheap and tacky um, and, and uh, very modernist parody of the Christian story because the Christian story is not about this person who just has this secret identity, who goes off and does violent things and saves the world. It's about a plan that was always there. God will come and will take its woes, its pain, its death upon himself. God entered into our world to take us into his world. He came to where we are to bring us to where he wants us to be. The incarnation is all about a God who enters into this world to bring us safely into the new Jerusalem. So incarnation is absolutely central to the whole Christian message. Christ, my highest heaven, I believe in Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. These two statements bring together the divinity and the humanity of Jesus. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, absolutely unique among human beings. No one else can be said to have been conceived by the Holy Spirit in the way that Jesus was. That's a way of saying that he had no human father, though he had a human mother. Uh, but that the other partner in the relationship that led to his birth was none other than God himself. And the Gospels records and tells us the embarrassment of Joseph when he found uh, that the woman to whom he was engaged and engagement in the Jewish society was perhaps more serious. It was a very real commitment to marriage. Uh, and when Joseph found that uh, Mary was pregnant, that was a matter of great shame and embarrassment in the ancient world until God showed to him the purpose of it and what lay behind it and that she conceived not of human sperm, human seed, but of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' birth is not abnormal. Jesus' birth is like the birth of any other baby. It is the conception of Jesus that is miraculous and unusual. God had planted that seed a seed of his own being in her. If Jesus had merely been born of human parents, then he would not only have been like us, but he wouldn't have been any different from us. Born of the Holy Ghost, he's like us, but different from us. He is both human and divine. Born merely by a natural process of human parents, 
meant that he would have inherited the gene of sin, as it were, and have been tainted and fallen and corrupted by sin. But if he's to help us at all, he needs to be someone who is free from that and uh, able to eventually offer a sacrifice and die, not for his own sins or his own sinful condition, but to be a substitute for us. So it's an absolutely vital piece of the jigsaw puzzle that fits together of the complex picture of Jesus. In the Apostles' Creed, apart from Jesus himself, there are only two historical figures mentioned. One is Pontius Pilate. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. And the other, of course, is Mary, his mother. Mary emphasizes uh, the other side of the coin to the phrase conceived of the Holy Ghost. These two statements bring together the divinity and the humanity of Jesus. Here is the human angle on the birth of Jesus Christ from a divine angle conceived by the Holy Ghost, from a human angle born of a virgin. It takes up the prophecy of Isaiah and applies it to Mary in a very particular and special way. Here is a declaration that Mary was free from human sexual intercourse before that time. She was a virgin, yet still gave birth to a very human yet divine child and that was because of the operation of the Holy Spirit in her. The virgin birth has been a very controversial teaching throughout the history of the church and remains so today in some quarters. And yet it is affirmed in the Apostles' Creed as being of the very heart and essence of the Christian message itself. Over the last century or so, people have often come back to the question of the virginal conception of Jesus and puzzled over it as though we know it can't be true, so what must be true instead? And this has become really quite obsessive for some people, so that I find every Christmas some radio station or television program phones me up and says, um, Bishop, do you believe in the virgin birth? Or what are you going to say about Jesus being born of a virgin? As though this was really the heart and center of all Christian belief. Now, it's important to say it really does matter very much because it's right at the beginning of two of the four Gospels, Matthew and Luke. In Matthew's Gospel, a story about Joseph being told that his wife is to have a child conceived by the Holy Spirit. In Luke's Gospel, a story about Mary being told um, that she is going to have a child that way. So Matthew's Gospel sees it from Joseph's point of view and Luke's Gospel sees it from Mary's point of view. That's interesting for another reason, which is that those stories are quite clearly not derived from one another. It isn't the case that Matthew has read Luke or Luke has read Matthew and he's just produced a different version of the same tale. They're quite different stories. So clearly from very early on in Christianity, there was this sense that Jesus' conception was different. And the other thing to say about that is you can search back in Judaism for prophecies about a virgin birth, if you like. The closest that you get is one in Isaiah, but nobody reading Isaiah 7 in the two or three centuries before the time of Jesus, so far as we know, had ever said, there you are, this means that the Messiah is going to be born of a virgin. Nobody had actually read that passage in Isaiah 7 like that before. So it doesn't look as though, and this is what a lot of people have said, of course, it doesn't in fact look as though um, everyone was expecting that a Messiah had to be born of a virgin, so the early Christians made up that story to suit. It looks rather as though something very, very extraordinary happened and in fear and trembling, they went off in search of as good biblical backup for it as they could. And they found that one passage in Isaiah 7. Nevertheless, for the fuller picture, when we stand back from the whole thing, we have to say, yes, this is actually how it happened. And I no more understand that in terms of contemporary science than I understand the resurrection in terms of contemporary science. And this is one thing we have to be very clear about. People have often said for the last 200 years, oh, they believed in all that sort of thing then because they were pre-scientific and they didn't know the laws of nature, which is absolute rubbish. You see, people in the ancient world knew perfectly well that dead people do not rise from their tombs. 
Um, you know, Pliny said so, Aeschylus said so, Homer said so, all kinds of people in the ancient world comment on the fact that dead people don't rise. And the early Christians say, yes, but on this occasion he did. And in the same way, as C.S. Lewis said a generation ago, the reason Joseph was worried about Mary's pregnancy was not because he didn't know the laws of nature, but because he did. And uh, in other words, they were as shocked by this as we are. They were as ready to assume the worst about this as we are. And yet they went on and told that story. And the only reason I can see why they did was because it actually happened. Now what interests us about that is the fact that he was born of a virgin. That too is unique. But in the early church, what really mattered, what was at stake in this doctrine was the fact that he was born, that he was a real human being, that he had a real mother, Mary. And so we're reminded here of both the divinity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. But in talking about the virgin birth of Jesus, we are saying that in some way Christ is born into this world that he does not share this situation of original sin. We are contaminated by sin from the moment of our birth on account of original sin. Jesus entered into this world as one who did not have sin, that he is to be our savior, our redeemer, that there is something about him which means that he does not share the common human condition of being born into this world sinful. The scripture has many wonderful uh, names for Jesus Christ, but uh, among them is the uh, idea and the concept that he is the second Adam. Uh, the book of Romans particularly has that uh, in its background. And uh, the significance of that is to say that he is uh, a human being as we are, just as the first Adam was, but that unlike the first Adam, he did not disobey, but in his life as the second Adam, he perfectly obeyed. What Adam, as the first of all creation, lost for us in the Garden of Eden, Jesus, as the second Adam, restores for us and recovers for us in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross of Jerusalem. The idea of the virgin birth is setting out before us this fundamental idea that is not part of the problem. He is its solution. He brings the remedy for sin in which we can share. Oh, The genius of the gospel is that he is the God-man, that he is both fully God and fully man. Here we are in a dispute with God. There's a, a divorce and a division between us, and uh, God, the holy and almighty father of the universe, is offended by our sin, and we are lost in alienation as we're cut off from God, and we need to be brought back together and reconciled and just as you build a bridge by coming from both ends of the spectrum, so here is this unique and wonderful gospel which says the answer lies not in human beings trying to reach up to God, as in many religions they do, because we couldn't reach up far enough. Or even that God in his condescension merely reaches down to us, but that God fully enters into our humanity and redeems it and comes at the problem both ends of the spectrum at once. So he is the divine human being, unique son of God, bringing God's mercy and grace to us from that end, but fully entering into our humanity and sharing our experiences, except for sin, from the other end, uniquely qualifying him to be our saviour. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 here. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. He really does 
understand uh, Jesus intercedes for us and he knows what it's like to be human. Um, he really can say, I know what it's like, because he really has been there, he really has done that. If he was tempted in every way, just as we are, then obviously the possibility was very real for him to go the way of, uh, of temptation and go down its path, as in the temptation in the wilderness, when the tempter comes to him those three times, and I'm sure at other times as well, of course, and uh, Christ has to send him away with words of scripture with which he defends himself. For it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, and so on. So the temptations were real. They're not just phantom temptations. They were real temptations for the master. He goes on to the very last element when he's there in the garden of Gethsemane and facing the cross and he's asking the father, could he be spared? If it be possible, let this cup of suffering depart from me, nevertheless not my will but thine. At that point the temptation is as real as ever. The sweat is pouring off him like drops of blood. It was real. It was real. That is a help for us. Tempted in every way, truly human, and yet never sinned. Therefore the only person who could take the responsibility, the penalty of our sins upon himself, because he had no sins to pay for. Therefore, he's the perfect Redeemer, the perfect Savior, the God-man, Jesus Christ. So it isn't that I can start off in some philosophical framework and say, let's suppose for the sake of argument that there might be a world with a God like this and why would he become human and would he have to be totally divine? And we can't do it like that. We have to start off with Jesus, which is always a risk. Not everyone likes taking that risk because they say, how can we be sure about Jesus? And the answer is the same way that you're sure about all the things in the world that really matter, by embracing them and by going with them and by testing them out and trusting them. So that um, for me, it is a matter of the more I know Jesus, the more sense it makes to see him as fully divine, fully human. If he is not fully divine, then Christianity collapses into being another variety of either pagan or some other sort of religion. Um, if he's not fully human, then he has not actually fulfilled any of that purpose from Genesis 1 right the way on. Because the, the world was made in such a way that there should be a human being responsible for it. If we really believe that the Incarnation is true, that God Himself has become a human being, then we're led to think about His mother, His earthly mother, Mary. Mary becomes a figure of the ultimate faith. She's submitting to a command that's humanly and rationally impossible. She was willing to be radically available to God for whatever God wanted to do with her life. Jesus says, you know, that we must lose ourselves for his sake. She basically had to lose herself. A word comes that has to be very shocking to a 12 or 13 year old girl in Israel. She says, let it be done according to your word. So she is, first of all, the model of faith from which all other models are to come. When Gabriel comes to her and gives her this announcement, she would have said, oh, not me, Lord, someone else. But instead she says, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Lord, if this is what you want to do, do it. I'm here for you. She's agreeing to something that's impossible, that she has not had sex, that she cannot become a mother. And yet she bows her head and she accepts the mission. She becomes the mother of Christ because of her faith in the action and the ability of God to make this happen. Such faith and such trust in God. And then later you have that wonderful song when she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth and she just praises God for choosing her to be the vessel of his will. Often stories about Mary stress how difficult this act of faith was. One great theologian, Kierkegaard, talked about the fact that God didn't go around telling everybody else that she was going to become the mother of the Messiah. To everybody else, she looked like she was just carrying an illegitimate child. 
she was risking everything, her reputation, her future, her livelihood, everything in, in her culture. She would have been subjected to all sorts of rumor, gossip, ridicule, a lot of slander and innuendo. We know that from secular history of the times that uh, much later in, in the first century, there were rumors spread by the enemies of Christianity that she had conceived this child by a Roman soldier. We know that Jesus, at times in his ministry, he had insults hurled at him. His enemies said, we aren't born of fornication, implying, but you were. We know how, who our father was, but you don't know who your father was. She looks like an unwed mother. She looks like she's carrying an illegitimate child. But in the realm of faith, she understands that what she is doing is not understood by external things, but it's understood through faith. And so like Noah, like Abraham, like every person of great faith in the Bible, she's isolated from the fallenness of the world. This woman of trust, and faith who nurtured the child Jesus, who was there at the cross, this faithful woman. There she is. The disciples forsake him. They flee, but Mary is there. Mary has a great role also in the thought of the reformers, especially Martin Luther, who wrote a beautiful commentary on the Magnificat, in which he said, Mary exemplifies the doctrine of justification by faith alone because she believed. She heard the word and received it and believed it. He says, if she had not believed, she would not have conceived. So Mary is the example as the handmaiden of the word of God who receives the message of grace and believes it. Magnify my soul God's greatness in my Savior I rejoice. All the ages call me blessed. In his praise I live.